Hello. Uh, this is the first of two weeks uh, in which we talk about uh, the Mafia. Uh, this week we'll be talking about the history uh, of Italian organized crime, Sicilian Mafia, uh, both in Sicily and in the United States. And then next week uh, we will talk about uh, some of the businesses and practices of, of the mob, um, particularly uh, the Mafia in the United States. What is, I guess we begin with a question of what is the Mafia? Um, is it a fluid network of families? Uh, is it a highly organized, uh, uh, business-like um, organization uh, that just happens to be involved in criminal enterprise? Is there even a Mafia? Um, you know, uh, Bruschetta in 1984 uh, claimed that uh, Cosa Nostra was real in Sicily, but not everyone believes it. Um, you know, in Sicily, that's where we want to start, that's where the Mafia begins, um, we can look at the Mafia uh, through a, a kinship model, uh, looking at a kind of an organization by kinship, where membership in the organization is passed down uh, primarily through kinship lines, you know, family, um, with most of the membership being tied together by family. Uh, though understand that just because you're a member of a family uh, in Sicily does not necessarily mean uh, that you might be a part of uh, Cosa Nostra. Um, the reality is, uh, you know, the mafia doesn't just take anyone, even if you're a family, and, and those individuals... Uh, in a crime family that, uh, you know, the, the higher-ups, the people in charge felt uh, weren't really um, mafia material, uh, they would be encouraged to find employment outside the family, to, to do something else. Um, in addition, uh, the families had, uh, they had some rules about admitting too many uh, of the kids at once, uh, trying to keep uh, the membership down. They used to say, uh, you know, tell kid, you say it like this: Violata Fogato, or the guts, you know, to be to be in the crime family, to, to do uh, the family business. You found something else. You were encouraged to find something else to do. Uh, you were necessarily looked down upon, but you were found. They found you something else to do, uh, something legitimate, and that's possible. Sometimes that legitimate business kept you tied to the family business in some way. Um, what does this word mafia mean? Uh, there are a bunch of different, you read uh, Dr. Ross' book, there's a bunch of different possible origins uh, for the word mafia. Um, there's the Arabic origin referring to uh, the Arabic word that means a bold man. Um, it could refer to an Arabic tribe uh, that controlled Palermo during the 9th and 11th centuries. Uh, but by the 19th century, regardless of where this word mafia comes from, uh, by the 19th century, it was a part of American culture, um, and the word really was kind of associated with the darker nature of man. Um, the nucleus, in Sicily, the nucleus of an organization was the Cosca. Uh, that was uh, plural being Cosque. Um, this was kind of like a localized fraternity. Um, uh, it was very they, the Cosca. The Cosca were very territorial. Uh, usually, they took the name of whatever town they were in. Uh, so you know those. You know you watch the Godfather. You have the Corleone family. Well, there's you know Corleone, the city in Sicily, and there's a Corleone uh, crime family. Uh, not the same as you know the ones in the movies. There's the you know, the Palermo, uh, the groups out of Palermo. Um, uh, sometimes they would get more localized. You talk about maybe names for the neighborhood um, uh, the family came through. And wherever your territory was, wherever Acosta's territory was, um, you uh, you drew a piso, a, a, a tribute for the people living there uh, in exchange for protection and, and other favors. Um, where do uh, these... Uh, these men of honor, these bold men, come from. Well, in 
we look for a, the 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 genesis of the mafia, we need to look at 19th century Sicily. Um, talking about the end of feudalism in 1812, uh, left the island of Sicily with a bunch of large estates, a lot of property owners. But the property owners themselves like to live in the cities, since so you got a lot of country estates out in the country. Property owners they're living in uh, they're living in Palermo, they're living in Corleone. Um, they're not taking care of their estates, and so they would hire men to run their estates for them uh, while they were in the cities. And these men were called uh, gabliotti. Uh, and so the way this worked is you had the landowners, if we were to draw a hierarchy, you'd have the landowners at top, you would have the gabliotti, these, uh, these men in the middle, the rent that, that, that took care of the property uh, for the landowners. Uh, and then they, in turn, rented the land out to tenant farmers. Uh, these Gablioni, they became more popularly known as men of respect. Um, and they, through their relationship with both the landowners and uh, the tenant farmers, became uh, to control uh, the agriculture in Sicily. Uh, they controlled, uh, through their control of the farmers, through renting the property, they controlled um, the production of agricultural products, but they also, because their relationship with the landowners, they actually controlled the sale and transportation, and so they controlled everything. And you'll see as a pattern with the mafia uh, that they, rather than sitting at the top of some business, the mafia likes to sit in the middle, and they control everything outwards. Uh, you'll see it. With, with alcohol during prohibition, you'll see it with, dr with the drug trade, you'll see it with the white slavery trade. Uh, you'll see the mafia as this nebulous organization that sits in the middle and controls the manufacturer, controls transportation, controls retail sell. But they never set themselves out there as the people in charge, which is a good plan to do so. You know, sets them up in a public limelight, and they don't want that. They want to be that power behind what's going on. Um, along this time, as we start to see this the beginning of a business pattern uh, with the Gabriotti, the, the, these men of respect, uh, later called men of honor, uh, you start to see the development of Omerta, uh, the uh, code of silence. Uh, this was uh, this began as, as the Gabriotti punishing the landowners for talking about their business and grew into the code of conduct for the mafia that still sort of holds true today. I mean, the um, you know one of the things you'll look at on the midterm exam is, is uh, how the breakdown of Omerta uh, has affected the downfall uh, and affected the families. Um, but this far back in history, you know, we're talking about a time where Omerta was very strong. You didn't talk about the business with outsiders. You didn't talk to the police. You left honest cops alone. Um, you didn't uh, you didn't murder someone else in the family. These were very strong values, um, and it gave it gave the early mafia some strength, um, and particularly because uh, of their rules, the parts of Omerta that that forbid members from. Uh, just indiscriminately killing people, uh, it gave them some respectability among the people. The the tenant farmers they might not have been happy about having to pay tribute, uh, you know, piso to the uh, to the men of honor, but the violence and the killing and, and the and the nasty parts of the business, the families kept to themselves and they didn't let that they tried not to let that spill over uh, into the general public. In eighteen sixty. Uh, Sicily became part of uh, Italy, and many Sicilian men, as a result, ended up joining bandit groups. It was funny because the Sicilian, the Italian army, as it came into Sicily, the common people cheered them, and they were all happy about it. And then when it came time for the Sicilian men to participate, to become part of the army, they refused service and fled into the hills as bandits. At the same time, you saw a great increase uh, in poverty in the island. And the people saw the central government of Italy as undesirable. Uh, they turned inwards towards themselves and actually looked towards these men of respect uh, for protection from the landowners who were now in support of the central Italian government. Um, and here you start to see some of the, uh, 
the myths and the, and the, uh, the stories about uh, you know the, the mafiosi uh, being men of the people and being actually the ones protecting the people. Um, whether they were actually doing that, the, the mafiosi, the men of honor, they were really just uh, taking advantage of the situation. But from the people's perspective, yeah, these were crooks, but they were our crooks. And they were, uh, they were that buffer between the Sicilian people and the, and the central Italian government that they didn't want. Um, between 1863 and 1870, uh, Sicily saw a great rise uh, in violence. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of this, these, these men that fled to the hills as bandits were causing a lot of this violence. And so this, the people... Saw the mafioso, uh, the, uh, the, mafia, the mafia, the mafiosi, uh, these men of honor, they saw them as protecting them from the bandits and the criminals, um, which was kind of ironic because at least part of the time they were behind the bandits. But that's kind of how the mafia does business. Uh, in 1874, the Italian army comes to, comes back to Sicily, and they're, they're come with the, uh, the goal of restoring order. Uh, but the Sicilian people, uh, they resist. They, uh, they don't want change in their little island country. They, uh, they, don't want out, they don't want outsiders as part of their political leadership. And even though Sicily has been a part of Italy for, since 1860, the Sicilian people see themselves as Sicilians and not Italians. Um, you, ask any, you ask anybody from my mother's family, and you ask them, "Are you Italian?" Because you you go, you know, so my mother's family, you know, my aunt Chip and my aunt Ruth and, and my uncle Austin up in up in Jersey, and you and you talk to them, you go to their homes, and nothing is spoken in the homes but Italian. Um, you know, I have several aunts, and they're getting up there, uh, but I have several of my much very old aunts uh, that came over in the boat um, uh, don't speak English still. And so Italian is all unspoken at home. If you, if you hear them speaking Italian, you might ask them, are you Italian? You know, and first you think, well, here's your sign. But they'll tell you, no, we're Sicilian. And there's a lot of national pride among Sicilians. And, and this was the situation here in 74 when the Italian army comes down to restore order. And the Sicilian people didn't want outside political influence. They would have, they preferred the mafiosi. Uh, to to control, and so what the mafia did? They're 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 not dumb guys. These are not dumb thugs. Uh, the mafioso they basically clamp down on the violence. They uh, they promise the Italian army, hey, we'll we'll they promise the Italian Senate government, we'll take care of it. We'll bring violence down if you'll just let us control the island. You let us control our home, and they did. Uh, and the way they did it was the mafia looked at every little bandit group that wasn't connected to one of the families and squashed them. And violence dropped when the Italian army went home. Uh, you see here again, another, uh, you'll see another example of the mafia playing both ends. Um, they're cooperating with the central government, which is hated by the people. They're oppressing, uh, at the same time, they're oppressing the common people, but the common people say, oh, these are our saviors. They, they made agreements with the, the Italian army and the army went home and and, the, and then there's peace, and the violence is down, and we love these guys. And, and the whole time, these guys are, are taking their money. Um, but Sicilian people were not dumb. And after about a quarter century of being having to pay tribute, having to pay piso, and, and, and dealing with the violence, and uh, just dealing with the corruption... Of, of a mafia-controlled Sicily. Uh, between 1900 and 1913, you saw a mass, and I mean a massive immigration, uh, of Sicilian citizens out of the island. Most of them came to the United States. They fled into Europe. Uh, they went into lots of places. A majority of them uh, went into, went came to the United States. And so you see the first, uh, first kind of the first wave of of Italian, of Sicilian citizens coming to the United States, um, wasn't much that much longer when Mussolini took power. Um, 
1917, you saw a second mass immigration of Sicilians. Only this time it was the Mafia. And they were fleeing uh, Mussolini's reign. As Mussolini decided he didn't want to share power uh, with the Mafia uh, in the island of Sicily. And so he had one of his uh, leaders decide they were going to squash the mob. Uh, and so the mob left and came to the United States. Yay for us. At the end of the war, towards the end of the war, the Mafia came back to Sicily. 1943, uh, there are numerous reports uh, to indicate uh, or to support the rumors that the Allied invasion of Sicily was supported or at least helped along uh, by the Mafia. And there's, whether the Mafia really paid a, played a part in the Allied invasion of, of Italy and, and Sicily uh, is debated. I mean, you got to consider, is NATO, uh, what was going to become NATO with the Allied powers during World War II, were they really going to hand over uh, classified invasion plans to a bunch of mobsters, a bunch of criminals? Think about it. But there are some incidents that, that we know happened. Um, uh, in Sicily, there were a group of local mafiosi that uh, attacked, an Itali attacked the Italian naval command in Sicily. Uh, and captured uh, the German-Italian plans for defending Sicily and turned them over to the Allies. Uh, one of the things that the Germans and Italians had done was they had mined all the waters around Sicily. Uh, when the Mafia attacked the Italian Naval Command, uh, they found a, a safe. And when they opened the safe, they had uh, the German code books out of that safe. They had the safe passages through the, mine, through the, the minefields and the waters around Sicily. And they had the complete plans for German, the German-Italian uh, defense of Sicily and Italy. And they turned all that over to the Allies. And so there is some truth to the stories that the Italian, the, the Allied invasion of Sicily and Italy and the retaking of that part of, of European continent was helped along by the Mafia. Um, how much involvement did Lucky Luciano have in this? That's debatable. Um, after World War II, the Mafia was largely tolerated. Um, you know, the leaders, NATO, the new Italian government, they knew they were there, they knew they were entrenched, but through the Mafia's control of the Christian Democratic Political Party, they uh, had a stranglehold on politics in Italy and Sicily and were instrumental in keeping the socialists out of power in Italy, and so they were tolerated. Um, and for a long time, uh, mafia uh, corruption uh, and mafia control of the voting booths uh, and things the mafia did to make sure that they stayed in power were ignored uh, by the Italian government, by NATO, solely because uh, they kept uh, they kept the communists out. It wasn't until well after the war, I'm talking the 1950s, that the Sicilian Mafia began referring to itself as the Cosa Nostra, um, our thing. Um, and the Mafia, the Sicilian Mafia has gone through a bunch of names. Uh, sometimes their names given to them, sometimes their names they've taken on. Um, La Cosa Nostra is just kind of the most well-known, the most popular of, of monikers that have been, that have been given uh, to the mob, uh, to the mafia. Um, and there's a lot of events that, that occur, um, you know, after here in the building of the mafia, and you read a lot about that in Dr. Ross' book. Um, there's one particular situation uh, that I want to tell you about in this lecture because it highlights, gives you a really good example of how the mafia uses political and economic and social conditions to control and to gain power. Um, and, and you know, I'll just give you a couple of heads up. There is a question on the midterm exam about providing examples and, and discussing how the mafia uses so, uh, political and, and social and economic conditions uh, to gain control uh, and, and to gain corruption. Uh, a period right after World War II ended uh, is referred to by some as the Sack of Palermo. Um, and the reality is World War II, uh, between the German-Italian army conquering Sicily and, and driving the, the Mafia out, and then the Allies driving the German and the Nazis out, and the Axis powers out, 
uh, left Sicily a mess. Um, left, in particular, the city of Palermo was just devastated. This is uh, Palermo, the, the city, uh, probably one of the most prominent cities. When we talk about or the most prominent towns, when we talk about the history of the mafia, Palermo stands out. It's the town where my mother's family is from. Um, but Palermo was devastated. Uh, buildings were, were, were ruined. Um, you know, thousands, upwards of, of, of 14,000 people were homeless. Um, and on top of that, you had a 20% increase in population. So you've already got uh, 14,000 homeless people because of the devastation to the buildings and the destruction of the war. And then you got 20,000, 20% increase in population. You've got a little bit of a housing problem. And that becomes an economic situation that the mafia can take advantage of. Uh, remember, the mafia, as I mentioned a little bit a little bit ago, the mafia controlled the, the Christian Democratic Party. Um, in particular, you had a man named Anton Fen, Fenfani. Uh, and, and Anton Fenfani uh, is leader of the Democratic Christian Party uh, in Italy. And he sends a man named Giovanni Giola uh, to uh, Palermo. He becomes the Democratic Party secretary in Palermo. And so here's a vacancy in politics. And so now we got economics and we have politics. There's a vacancy in politics. You've got uh, the leader of the Demo of this power, this this leading political party controlled by the mafia. He sends a mafioso, this Giovanni Giola. Uh, they send him. To, to Palermo uh, to be the, the Democratic Christian Party, the D.C. secretary uh, in Palermo. And uh, Giovanni Giola, he has uh, control over government jobs. This is the position that he gets put in. Uh, Giovanni uh, has control of the government jobs. He has control of licensings. Um, he has control of, of, of land grants. Uh, anything that has to do with licensing and grants and Building permits is controlled by Giovanni Giola. Uh, and so you have the mafia in control of who gets to build, to rebuild the city of Palermo. Um, uh, Giovanni, he, he appoints a couple of guys. He appoints uh, Avito Sia uh, Massimino and Salva Limo, Lima. He appoints these two guys the Office of Public Works. They're the, and he puts these two guys, uh, also Bafiosi, uh, puts these two guys in charge of pr approving building permits. These two guys gave 80% of all the new building permits in Palermo to five guys. And these five guys were not necessarily contractors. Uh, they were just guys that they were approved by the government to have the contracts and so you would you would say you know uh, Vito or Salvo they would give the contract to one of these guys and someone else would build. And these three guys Giovanni Giolia, Vito Car, CX, Sia Massimino, and Salva Lima, particularly Vito and Salva, control construct the construction industry. In Palermo, between 1950 and 1992, we're talking 40 years, these two made men, these two mafia men, controlled all building permits in Palermo. Um, they ends in 1992 because uh, Vito was convicted of corruption in 92, uh, and Limo was murdered a couple of months after Vito's conviction. But through these two guys, they didn't just control who got permission to build, they controlled the contracts, they controlled the subcontractors. So they controlled the subcontractors that supplied the building materials to the contractors. The contractors had to rely on these two guys to get the building permits. And on top of all of that, the high society made men, or men of honor, controlled the landowners and the building owners. And so the Mafia, for 40 years, in Palermo and in Sicily, decided what was going to get built. They decided who was going to build it. They decided who, would, who worked on those projects. 
They decided who supplied the projects. They controlled everything. But it's the way the people wanted it. It's scary, huh? And there's significant change for the Mafia occurs in the 50s and 60s. And that is their involvement in narcotics. Um, prior to the 1950s and 1960s, the Mafia kept uh, stayed very close to the legitimate businesses. And they, uh, most of their illegal businesses, they were just providing for vices. You know. um, they, you know, they covered for, uh, they provided services that were illegal and in high demand. Things like gambling and prostitution. Um, untaxed cigarettes, but they kind of stayed away from drugs. Um, uh, drug trafficking happened. I mean, there were uh, mafia men that got into drug trafficking, but it was mainly something that was tolerated. Uh, it was not an official part of the business. It was something that you know mafiosi were allowed to do on the side, but it was frowned upon. It was greatly frowned upon. Uh, you know, dealing in uh, dealing in drugs. But when the U.S., when the United States, uh, through things like the Harrison Narcotics Act, or the Harrison Narcotics Control Act, began restricting uh, and putting uh, anti-drug laws in place, uh, the mafia realized that it, that was just a huge opportunity to make money, um, and so they began to get involved. Uh, in particular, their involvement began in 1957 with the vacation of an American mafia uh, figure named Joe Banana, Bonanno, uh, Joe Bananas. Uh, Joe uh, decided to spend a little vacation in Sicily, um, and Joe was vacationing in Sicily because he needed to get away. When he got to Sicily, he discovered a little something. There was almost no demand for illegal narcotics in Sicily. The Sicilian people just didn't use drugs. They didn't have the great demand like there was for the United States. And because there wasn't a demand for illegal narcotics among the Sicilian people, the government just didn't really care. They didn't spend a lot of time enforcing it because drug use wasn't a problem in Sicily. But if the government's not paying attention, bing, opportunity for the mob. Uh, and so it, Joe Bananas or Joe Bonanno realized was that uh, the mafia was already smuggling untaxed cigarettes. Uh, and so uh, there was, there went a whole lot of extra effort involved in taking the same smuggling routes they used for untaxed cigarettes and using those things to, using those routes to smuggle heroin out of the south of France. Um, the the so-called French Connection involvement there, and you read about the French Connection uh, and its fall and its relationship to the growth of the Mafia's narcotics business in your textbook. Um, in October of 1957, Bonanno met with the with uh, Car Carmel Gal Galante, Giovanni Giovanni uh, Bonentin, Frank Gar Garofalo and other leaders of the Sicilian Mafia, including another U.S. mafiosi, Lucky Luciano. And they formed an agreement, a link between the American and Sicilian Mafias uh, for the smuggling of heroin. Uh, and I know, you know, there's some, uh, what's the time it is, um, you know, there's some confusion about uh, the American and Sicilian Mafia, they're the same, is it the same organization, is different organization? They are separate entities. Uh, but here is a time where they get into cooperating, they begin to work together. Uh, both the American and the Sicilian Mafia has recognized uh, that once they started to get heavily involved in the drug trade, uh, it would bring the attention of rivals and it would, it would bring up rivalries between the families. Uh, because while you might have this generic name, Mafia, uh, the Mafia was really a whole bunch of different crime families. Uh, and certainly they are, while they cooperate, they occasionally cooperate with one another, these crime families also would compete with one another. And, you know, the worry was if one family gained too big a share of the market, uh, that there would be some rivalry, there would be some violence. Uh, 
uh, and so Joe Bonanno and Lucky Luciano uh, suggested this idea of what they call the commission. And the commission, what the, the idea behind the commission was that each Sicilian province uh, would have its own commission and there would be an umbrella one above it, but they would be comprised of the leaders, uh, be comprised of representatives, excuse me, not leaders, but representatives uh, from groups of family, from the Costa. Uh, uh, the rule was that no family could send a capo or a captain or a leader uh, to represent because they didn't want too much power being invested in a single person. And I want you to remember that for later uh, because there's a time when the commission's going to change. And you're going to see men like Lucky Luciano and Joe Bonanno sitting on the commission uh, when the original intent was that men like that did not sit on the commission because we didn't want them getting too much power. So each family sent a representative but they didn't send a capo. Uh, and, then, and the function of the commission was simple. Uh, it was to rule, it was to mediate between crime families and to make rulings on the murder of mafiosi. So if you know one family wanted to rub out another family's a guy from another family, uh, they would have to go through the commission to get permission. From the commission to get permission. No, you get the idea. Let's see, what do I want to talk next? Uh, 1962 through 1969, uh, we see an event that's called the First Mafia War. And I, much like I did when I taught this, told this story in class, I want to tell it, I want to tell the end of the story first and then go back. Uh, and because the end of the story is truly significant because it caused a great deal of damage uh, to the Mafia. In, on June 30th, 1963, uh, Palermo police, they got a phone call about an abandoned car sitting in an open field. Um, they had already had once that morning had a car bomb go off. And so, uh, in fact, they did, killed a couple of people. And so the police were very cautious. And they come out to this car uh, and they discovered a bomb sitting in the back seat. And so they, they call people out. They get, um, they get experts out. And uh, they get the bomb diffused and taken out of the car and everyone's okay. And it's yay victory for the police. And then a uh, Lieutenant Mario Mavasa uh, opens the truck and seven men died in this resulting explosion. Uh, the explosion damaged trees hundreds of yards away. Um, there's actually a memorial uh, with the name of the names of the seven dead men standing on the, on the spot where that car was today. Police responded. Uh, this was uh, the Sicilian people. They were they were not unaccustomed to uh, the mob fighting among itself, but the mafia was pretty good about keeping their violence contained among themselves. Well, here you have this car bomb uh, that kills seven people, seven police officers, and the Sicilian government, the people say, you know what, we've had enough of this stuff, and in very short order. The Sicilian police arrested 40 people. Uh, they uh, just suspected of being involved. Um, none were convicted. But it, not only did it spell the end of this first mafia war, but it damaged the mob. Um, it caused a lot of guys to sit in jail for a while and, and lose money. Uh, so it damaged a lot of the mobsters financially. And it drove the mafia underground. Uh, it had them in hiding for a while, or doing at least doing things more covertly. Uh, now this war started, now it ended in 63, it started in, in 62 with car bombs and uh, shootouts that become common throughout Sicily. But it started in February 62. Um, between, and it was a fight between the La Bambera brothers the Barbera, B-A-B-E-R-A, Barbera Brothers, and the Grecos. And it was uh, an interesting story. Um, they had, uh, the Barberas and the Grecos were working together. They were in a consortium uh, dedicated to shipping heroin out of Egypt. And one particular shipment in 62 uh, was, it was supposed to be delivered to New York. Uh, there was a mafiosi who was responsible, uh, Calcedea de Pisa, uh, but when the ship got to New York, the drugs weren't there. Uh, the commission uh, 
uh, initially blamed uh, DePisa uh, for the theft. Um, or excuse me, they investigated, the commission cleared uh, DePisa of, of the theft. They said DePisa wasn't responsible, and this really angered the LaBarbera brothers. And so in 62, in December of 62, uh, the LaBarbera brothers have DePisa rubbed out. Uh, they're murdered. He was sitting in his car uh, in in Palermo um, uh, with some of his family members, and they had him shot and killed. And that kind of touched off, because, of course, De Pisa is uh, working for Grecos. And so this touches off this conflict between the Grecos and the Libaberas. It gets a little more, it gets a little stickier in January. The next January of 63, when Salvador La Barbera is killed, um, and Angelo disappears. So you have the two brothers, Salvador and Angelo and La Barbera. Salvador is killed, and Angelo disappears. And for a little while, he's presumed killed, and he shows back up in Rome. Uh, in February, the next, the next month, La Barbera, uh, the surviving La Barbera, um, retaliates. Uh, he goes after Little Bird Greco and destroys his house with a car bomb. Little Bird gets away. Uh, in April, uh, two men pull up in an open Fiat, an open-top Fiat, the little Italian sports car, or kind of a cute thing, like only an MG Midget, only more stylish. Um, they pull up uh, and and just open fire uh, uh, with you know the in a fishmonger's. Shop and they killed two people, um, uh, and, and one of those people there, of course, was uh, involved. And the violence began to escalate: car bombs and shootings. Uh, in May of '63, uh, Angelo Barbero is shot. Uh, he's shot in the left eye, the neck, the chest, the back, the leg, the groin, and he survived. To add insult to injury, he's arrested. I mean, he takes I mean, the eye, the chest, I mean, all these bullet holes in him. And while he's recuperating in the hospital, the police show up and arrest him. While he's in the hospital. Creates a power vacuum. Uh, resulted in even more violence. All of this that culminated with the car bomb that I started the story about in 63. According to Antonio Buscetta, the original drug theft was conducted by Michel the Cobra Cavato. He was the capo of a family uh, who had lost in a big heroin deal to the Grecos. And so Cavato stole the drugs out of the shipment of New York, got to piece of blamed, and then cleared by the commission, started, touched off the war. And Cavada was the one that filled part of that power vacuum. Don't you just love the mafia? Oh, this class is so much fun. I get to tell these stories. Um, let's see, who do I want to talk about now? How about uh, Luciano Leguil? Uh, major, uh, major figure in the Sicilian mafia, uh, born in 1925. Um, hired by Michelle Navarra. Navarra was a, a Palermo doctor. Um, and it wasn't uncommon for uh, these mafiosi to be in professions like that. Um, uh, Navarra actually um, became uh, chief of the hotel, uh, chief of the hotel, chief of the hospital in Palermo uh, after his predecessor was mysteriously killed. Um, when Navarra, he hires Luciano Leguio. Uh, uh, Navarra is the, the capo in Corleone. In, in about 1946, he hires uh, Luciano Leguio uh, and just hires him as a guard in, his, in one of his estates near Corleone. Um, in 48, he orders Leguio to make the first of many kills. Uh, um, he murdered uh, Placido Rosito. Um, he was a union leader, a socialist that the mafia uh, wanted to get rid of. Um, and Leguio was brazen about it. He uh, quartered the man. He marched him out of town at gunpoint. Um, not really even hiding what he was doing. I mean, people saw him marching this guy out of town at gunpoint. Um, once he got him out of Corleone, they had the man kneel and put three rounds in the back of his head. 
It was interesting. Uh, he took two guys with him. Uh, those two guys testified against him. Uh, police arrested them. They, the two guys, they led them to what was left of the body um, and lots of other bodies that they found, and some of them attributed to the Gale. Um, two guys testified. Said, yeah, he did it. We saw him do it. Three in the back of the head, no problem. The Gale wasn't convicted. Amazing what happens when you buy judges. In 1956, Legio uh, sets up a, a livestock business, a, a livestock breeding business, as a front for smuggling stolen cattle. But also, he did it as a challenge to Navarra. Um, he's uh, kind of grown a little big for his britches. He decided that he wants to take Navarro's job. Um, and so he begins to target Navarro for harassment and intimidation. And in June of 58, uh, Navarro has had enough, and he sends some men uh, to deliver a message uh, to Luciano Leguio. Um, but they botched the job. Uh, the reality was uh, that Leguio had this reputation of being an expert shot, a, a marksman. Uh, and so these guys that Navarro sent to kill him, um, rather than getting up close and making sure they get the job done, uh, tried to get him from far away and missed. Uh, and Leguido murdered them. <sighs> Leguido eventually, after that, Leguido had had enough um, and had Navarra murdered. Uh, Navarra's body, uh, along with the body of one other, was found in his car just riddled with bullet holes. Um, he, it was a wonderfully staged crime. Uh, uh, Leguido's men then murdered Navarro's three top, top three soldiers in kind of an okay corral kind of shootout, um, which included the death of many innocent bystanders. But Leguido took over Navarro, took over as the capo. Uh, in October of 58, the Corleone newspaper ran an expose about Luciano Leguido. They uh, described him as this brutal man and, 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 and you know, tried to, to paint him as this horrible person. Three days later, the newspaper offices were blown up. And this is kind of a pattern of violence uh, common for Luciano Leguio. He, uh, this pattern continued for about five years uh, as he is trying to destroy the remnants of the Navarra family um, on the verge of victory. In 1963, that car bomb in Sevilla goes off. That same car bomb that ended the La Barbera Carco feud and brought government attention to the mafia also spilled, Luciano, spilled the end of Luciano Leguio's fight against the Navarra family. Uh, Luciano was one of uh, 64 uh, people of the Lugiano Navarre conflict that went to trial in 1969. All of them were acquitted. Uh, they were acquitted. Witnesses were intimidated. Ef evidence disappeared or was replaced. Uh, the judges made the judge made numerous questionable decisions, probably because he was on the mob's payroll. Um, but this acquittal, these arrests happened in '63. The acquittal didn't happen until '69. And the mafia needed to grow again. Um, yeah, you saw uh, Michelle, uh, the Cobra Cravato, uh, murdered uh, by a couple of Leguio's top killers. These, uh, we begin the pattern of violence, but you also see the mob, the mob needing money. And so they decide that they've got to tone down the violence because they've seen what will happen if you make the government pay attention. I mean, the mafia, they, these guys spent, a lot of these guys spent five, six years in jail awaiting trial and throughout the trial. And, uh, their businesses were wrecked. Many of them were, um, you know, approaching being broke. And so they wanted uh, to, to reinstate the commission, to bring back a way to mediate the violence, to prepare, to prevent things like uh, the Legio Navarra fight war and the Greco Libera war, and so they bring the commission back. Only the original commission, 
and they bring back a temporary commission, it was Luciano Leguil, a capo. It was Stefano Bontante, another capo of one of the Palermo's families. And Gaetano Tano Baldamanti, one of the guys who actually designed the original commission, drafted the rules of the original commission. These three guys formed a temporary commission. This was not the same commission that Bonanno had envisioned in 1957. Uh, rather than limiting, uh, limiting power, it actually allowed these men to draw more power to themselves. Because now you have capos, heads of families, sitting on the commission. In 74, the full commission was reinstated. But it was, rather than the original intention of Joe Bonanno, uh, became a way for the families to draw power together. When there were conflicts between families, their, their method for resolving the conflict was to seize the businesses for the commission and hold on to them. And so you saw Luciano Leguio and these other two men drawing a great deal of power. But it was, it was good for business. Like I said, uh, uh, the prosecution of, these, of the mafiosi after the 63 bombing, um, uh, a lot of the, the Corleone uh, families, a lot of the Palermo families uh, were devastated financially. And so they needed to start getting back some of their money. And they started out, they started out small. They started out um, with a series of kidnappings in Palermo uh, of rich businessmen. And then the ransom money for these kidnappings provided the seed money for illegal uh, products. They, uh, in 1970, you saw the mafia uh, taking that seed money and start smuggling tobacco and, and untaxed cigarettes. Uh, as many as 50,000 cases of untaxed cigarettes a month. But America's war on drugs just, it just drew their attention. It was a huge, huge opportunity to make money. And then the mafia got their big break in 75. Uh, a Turkish uh, drugs, drug and arms dealer approached the mafia about a business opportunity. And so the mafia was... Uh, developing heroin labs all over the island of Sicily. And so you'd get the raw plant, the raw product coming out of Turkey in the Middle East, being smuggled into Sicily, processed into heroin, and then transported to America and into Southern Europe or into the rest of Europe, Western Europe uh, along the same routes that they use for smuggling, uh, smuggling cigarettes. Um, and it began, it gave La Cosa Nostra the ability to monopolize uh, the entire heroin business between 75 and 82. They, they dominated the heroin market. Um, not only did they control the manufacture to the heroin labs in Sicily and the transportation in the United States, they began to also control uh, the retail distribution. And what we ended up doing was the Sicilian mob basically for a great deal of uh, a great deal of the seventies and early eighties, uh, every Italian pizzeria in New York and New Jersey was owned by the mob, and the mob basically just shipped the heroin in uh, the same shipments that uh, the ingredients for the pizza came in, and they owned and so they just brought in uh, the heroin, they brought in the pizza, sold the pizza, sold the heroin, um, used the pizza parlors uh, as a way to launder money. Just you know, put money in as cash. Um, yeah, there was a like I said, there's a time where uh, if you want authentic Sicilian pizza, you could, made by a connected man. By 1982, 80 percent of the world's heroin, or at least 80 percent of the heroin used in the northeastern U.S., was refined, shipped, and distributed by the Sicilian mafia. And by the late 70s, all that money that the mafia lost while sitting in jail made it all back and then some. Um, this increase, this great increase of funds for the city mob caused a change in the balance of power.
between the American and the Sicilian mobs as well. Um, the American mafia had always kind of had a provincial attitude towards the Sicilian mob, kind of saw them as their backwards, uh, backwards cousins from the old country. Um, saw them as easy labor. You know, if you wanted, if you want a thug, you you got you got someone from the old country to come over. Uh, you know, to take care of your heavy business. Well, with the Sicilian mafia having a stranglehold on the heroin trade, things changed. Um, you saw the Sicilian Mafia, not just the Italian, ver the American version of the Sicilian Mafia, but the real Sicilian Mafia, uh, having more control than ever. Uh, in, uh, in the United States, um, you even saw at one point uh, the Manano family actually run by Sicilian mobster. And that's, I think that's, I think that's going to do it. That's a good story. Uh, I think that's where we'll end there on the Sicilian mob. Uh, and then kind of, I want to pick up in part two of the video, uh, talking about, um, the mafia, the U.S. version of the mafia.